Nancy Dorgan. I apologize for the delay in the beginning of this program. We had some tef technical difficulties. Um, research and practice is presented by the AIA Residential Knowledge Community. This is the first in a series of programs um, that will advance evidence-based practice. Um, this is the idea that um, credible research can be used to um, improve practice. Um, Evidence-based practice originated within the medical profession where physicians and other healthcare providers have studied the difference in practice between different practitioners and learned that um, outcomes are um, better with certain practitioners and so the, the field of knowledge has been advanced to allow everyone to learn from, from that. Um, this is the first of a series of programs. Um, on evidence-based uh, practice or research that can be used to support evidence-based practice. Um, you can see a list here of uh, the future programs. I hope that uh, those of you who are joining us today will be able to join us again um, on the dates shown. Um, and again, all of these programs will be at 1 p.m. I'm joined today um, by two amazing researchers, Jamie Horwitz um, and Michael Monty, um, who will tell us more about uh, the ways in which research uh, can inform pr practice in housing. All of you who um, are on the call today are eligible to receive continuing education requirements uh, to meet your credit for your continuing education. Um, in order to do that, um, you'll have to stay on till the end of the program and answer the uh, questionnaire at the end of the program. It's the completion of that questionnaire uh, that will be used uh, to award CEUs. Anyone who has problems um, on the go-to webinar um, control panel, you can ask questions um, or report any difficulties you're having um, with the program. During this program, we'll have an opportunity to learn about the kinds of research that informs architectural practice, um, current trends um, in research and evidence-based practice, um, different strategies that are being used by practitioners to apply research uh, to their work and the ways in which um, housing research is being conducted, both in the academic academy but also um, in the field. And again, here's the information um, if you're looking for continuing education or supplementary education credit um, at the end of the program. And again, the panel on the right, uh, you can enter, type in questions uh, that will um, be submitted to the panelists at the end of the program. Our first speaker is Michael Monte. Um, Michael is the Executive Director of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture. This is a wonderful membership organization where schools of architecture join together to learn um, from each other and advance architectural education. Michael has done an amazing job of advancing the work in architectural schools and the learning between schools, and particularly in the area of housing. Um, he has uh, led the um, Association of Collegiate Architecture Schools to undertake research, um, including innovative design strategies for affordable housing and convening a conversation on affordable design. Um, he's also led the development of awards programs for housing curriculums within schools. And this has led to significant advancement in architectural knowledge among schools. And you can learn a little bit about that um, in a publication uh, from HUD Cityscapes uh, title, title that um, focuses on some of the university participation um, in housing. Mike has a doctorate from, uh, from the um, Binghamton University, and his work is in philosophy, interpretation, and culture, and his dissertation focused on environmental philosophy and ethics. Michael, welcome. 
Thanks, Kathy. And uh, let's advance the slide because I swear that's that's me being interrogated and not me being interviewed. So. <laughs> um, what I want to do in my presentation is give uh, an overview of the ways that research and architecture, particularly in housing, are being approached both in ACSA schools and in hopes that these research methods and activities can be used in various contexts for practice. So we'll start with the definition for research. This one's from James Snyder, uh, which I found in uh, the great book by uh, Linda Grote and David Wong called Architectural Research Methods. And research, it says, research is systematic inquiry directed toward the creation of knowledge. Now, I'll come back and, and a analyze that statement in a second. Uh, but first, I want to talk about some research types. So what are the basic methods that architects use, knowingly or not? Uh, the two most basic categories are qualitative and quantitative. And I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Thank you. I need to go back. There we go. Uh, quantitative research sets up number-based mathematical measures to test hypotheses and understand largely empirical phenomena um, in architecture, building performance studies, energy usage, heat gain, daylighting, the performance of environmental systems. But there's a lot in the sciences, of course, and economics. Qualitative research is probably more, more, more prevalent uh, among architects working in, in the studio. Uh, qualitative research can use a range of approaches to understand human behavior and decision making. Uh, there are some formal approaches there, ethnography, grounded theory, interpretivism. Um, but I think the methods are more, uh, are, are more familiar. Interviews and focus groups, post-occupancy analysis, behavior observation, field notes, and document analysis. Now, one of the things I want to underscore is that research is not just analytic and synthetic thinking, which is at the core of what architects learn under the rubric of critical thinking. Can you advance my slide, please? Thank you. Research is more than simply models, simulations, prototypes, all of which are part of what goes into research, but they lack something, and that's a plan guided by a set of research questions. And so one of the things um, I, I hope people will, will come out for this is that, get out of this presentation, is this idea that working at, in a firm or in a studio in a school, um, it's, 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 it's one thing to continue doing projects and try to learn from them. It's another to set out a set, a set of research questions that guide your practice. And not just to, to kind of reflect on them every time you do it, but to continuously reflect on them, write about them, share them. And so I'll go more in depth on that. Uh, back to uh, the definition. There are two parts of this that I want to call out. Uh, the definition, systematic inquiry directed towards the creation of knowledge. Now, there are two words there that I want to emphasize. Systematic and knowledge. Knowledge involves information, skills that you can apply in different contexts. It has a structure. It follows laws guided by principles. And we're asking you to think about the extent to which architects use knowledge in vari of various kinds in the ways that they practice. Systematic is the other key term. There's a plan in place for inquiring. But if you stand back and think about architecture projects, you see that architecture is often messier, a lot messier than science. You hear things like, Every project is unique. Architecture is an applied art. Moreover, much of what architects know is not written down, which goes back to this issue of knowledge. What do we mean by knowledge? There's, uh, there's a reason that architecture um, came up as, with an apprenticeship model, and, and the legacies of that still exist today. Despite all the codes, technical manuals, and the like that architects can turn to in order to make decisions about the details of the building, there's a lot that architects that I would call, have, there's a lot that architects have that I would call tacit knowledge. Things that, that, that they know they know, but they don't necessarily write down or that they, they uh, share with one another. But we'll get to that. So let's look first at a diagram that situates architectural research in a broader context. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, something that you can access online. This will, it's uh, available on the AIA website. The AIA Board Knowledge Committee had a research summit in 2007 
at the University of Washington. And I'm drawing on uh, a, a, a nice diagram that was prepared by Matt O'Donnell, who is dean of the School of Engineering at the University of Washington. And in his presentation in this summit, which you can download, uh, next slide, please. It describes research along two axes. The first one, up and down, looks at how interested is the research work in fundamental understanding, why things are the way they are. The second axis, left to right, is how much will this, be research, how much will this research be used? Now, architectural research is clearly on the right half of the grid because its use value is high. But I wonder how much you would think that the work of your firm is oriented towards a quest for, for fundamental understanding. Now, don't think about fundamental understanding in terms of knowledge for its own sake. Ask this question. Do you try to figure out a design solution for just that project? Think instead about generalizability and repeatability and the extent to which the work that you do answers these research questions that you conceptualize when you look at the, at the direction that your practice is going. So let's turn then to, uh, to one of the key words in the area of architectural research, uh, evidence-based practice. Kathy gave a good definition at the top of it. Evidence-based practice started in medicine to bring a more scientific approach to a profession that, like architecture, bases its work on, on, the, on, on the, the question of practice. Doctors practice medicine. That is, they apply knowledge to specific circumstances. So here's uh, Sherry, Sherry Aronson's definition. She says, evidence-based health practice means integrating the best available clinical evidence from systematic research with individual clinical expertise. So this sounds a lot like architecture. Um, Sherry's an architect at the Stardust Center for uh, Affordable Housing at, the, at Arizona State University. And um, I'm drawing a lot from, from her great work down there and in one of the ACSA projects that Kathy mentioned at the top. Uh, next slide. Here we go. Some evidence-based practice examples in healthcare. Um, uh, this is a government website that um, is a, a database of evidence on particular topics. This one's about alcohol c consumption and cancer risk. And um, what you see here is that it's not just about finding specific evidence. That is, when you're pr when you're pra when you're doing evidence-based practice, you don't just go look for evidence that supports what you want to do. It's that you survey and look for um, efforts to gather together what is known and evaluate it together. And so this example is um, uh, they searched 11 external database to, uh, to evaluate what we know about alcohol consumption and cancer risk. Uh, next, thank you. Uh, so we'll go back to, to uh, Sherry's definition. When she makes it more precise and talks about architects, she says that um, Applied to architecture, evidence-based practices, designers working with clients to make decisions based on the best information available from research. It's really just a restatement of what they do in healthcare. And in architecture and environmental design, there are multiple examples of this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the active design, guidance, the active design guidelines publication that was put out by New York City in conjunction with AIA New York. It gathers the best evidence that they had for um, active design, or um, act, act, promoting physical activity and health in design. Um, this is a book cover from uh, Robert Brandt, Gordon Chong, and Mike Martin's work that came out of the AIA Latrobe Prize from 2005. Uh, it includes design and policy guidelines. Um, uh, that happened about six years ago. Um, this is uh, the website healthdesign.org, which is a, a major resource for uh, healthcare designers. Um, they have all kinds of uh, knowledge and information as well as activities that uh, people in the healthcare design world, and you're probably familiar um, with healthcare design because they're, they're far ahead on evidence-based practice. And it's no mistake because in medicine, um, they're interested in evidence to support the clinical interventions that they do, and they want to do it in facilities that um, are uh, similarly grounded. Um, so l let's look a little bit more at, oh, sorry, I got one more. There's an example of a, a literature review uh, developed by Craig Z Zimmering at Georgia Tech and some other people um, that looks at uh, the evidence that, that um, healthcare and design uh, go together. 
So I want to talk about some of the challenges for in environmental design. Sherry Aronson cites several factors that make evidence-based practice such a challenge. She says, the practitioner's critical thinking, experience, and creativity in evidence-based design continues to play a central role in the design process. So you're not subverting, I think, the, 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 the most stimulating part of being an architect uh, just to apply evidence, because the solution needs to be targeted to the, to the specifics of client, program, and site, and within the context of what Sherry calls continuous flux changing demographic, economic, cultural, technological, and political con conditions. These are the things that you study in qualitative research, and you can't uh, merely um, um, study quantitatively. So evidence comes in various forms. The various sources that architects and others use to ensure that a building meets codes, safety standards, and the like. But when you're addressing these more difficult and less repeatable conditions that designers address, especially human dimensions, evidence is usually sporadic. So Sherry cites the work by D. Kirk Hamilton, who's a leader in evidence-based practice in healthcare facilities design, who introduced four levels of evidence-based practice. And I'm sorry, my slide um, got redrawn here, and it's um, covering up at the bottom. But um, at the first level, you familiarize yourself with the research literature. And this is what I mean before. You don't just look for evidence that supports exactly what you're doing. You need to know um, the pros and cons and, and both sides of the story in order to make informed decisions. In level two, you both project or hypothesize the results of the design solution that you're working on, and then you begin to measure its outcome. The levels three and four take research to the upper half of that grid that Matt O'Donnell, um, um, uh, that I introduced from Matt O'Donnell earlier, where there's a combination of, of uh, a high interest in use and a high interest in fundamental understanding. You begin to share your results publicly, and then you submit your work to various levels of peer review. In science, the key is for others to replica replicate your work and subsequently to build on it. Now, we're not looking for a solution to cold fusion here, but a lot of the work that architects do can have uh, tremendous consequences to um, the health and well-being of communities, particularly when it's done at a large scale. So we shouldn't underestimate the importance of sharing research here. Um, next, I want to give you a quote from a conference that ACSA had in 2007. Oops, sorry. One more slide. There we go. There we are. We're caught up. Um, this was uh, an ACSA teacher seminar, which we have um, every other year to focus on um, pedagogy and skills of teaching. Max Underwood, Stephen Kieran, and James Timberlake. Uh, Max Underwood's at Arizona State, and Kieran and Timberlake, of course, are uh, Kieran Timberlake Associates. And, the, and the, the theme of this conference went like this. Architects tend to see most acts of design as unique, a flywheel of initial input uninformed by past results, marginally informed by performative information. Site and program together give rise to circumstance. Circumstance inspires intention. Design organizes intention into instruction. Builders construct from what we instruct. And we all move on to the next set of circumstances and program, none the wiser. So the challenge is making research a systematic part of the work that you do in the firm. And, that prof and, and it's at that professional level, it gives you opportunities to uh, and, and uh, obligations, in fact, to systematically share your knowledge between firms, between academia, and with your clients. Now, there's an obvious crossover here, I want to point out, between design thinking and research. It's about asking the right questions. Just as you work with clients to figure out what their real needs are, you need to, uh, our, our research-based firms, look at the work that they do. But the challenge is writing, is writing about it, writing it down, systematizing it, following up with research questions, and sharing it. Um, I know that in, uh, in ACSA, we have um, a lot of awards, and we have a publication that focuses on publishing good design. And the challenge that we, try to, uh, we, we want faculty to do is to write critically about the design work that they do, as well as the design work that other people do. The Journal of Architectural Education um, has articles called uh, Design is a Form of Scholarship, and ACSA annually has a faculty design award, pro, uh, award program that uh, 
that, that it's very challenging because you have to step outside your own work and analyze it, document it, and um, justify it. So for the second part of my presentation, which I'm going to run through more quickly so we make up time here, I want to present an example of a series of projects where a team led by architects are seeking measurable outcomes in housing and using the feedback loop of iterative design, prototyping, and simulation and, me and measurement. ECHOMOD is a project at the University of Virginia that seeks to create sustainable, prefab affordable housing developed in partnership with affordable housing developers. The par participants seek to integrate multiple di disciplines into teams that yield measurable and agreed upon outcomes with the client. On top of that, it provides real world experience in designing, building, and evaluation for the students. The EcoMod program has five new design projects, two renovation projects, and a 2002 solar decathlon house, which won first prize for architecture and second prize overall. The project uh, EcoMod 1, out in, uh, next slide please, uh, was done with the Piedmont Housing Alliance. It's a two-unit condominium in Charlottesville, Virginia. As part of the design brief with the developer, their goal was to make the entire site habitable and usable. In their words, rather than a rectangular box without functional outdoor spaces, the out-in house is placed to merge outside and inside places. Technologies and features include a potable rainwater collection system, the first in the city of Charlottesville, a solar, water, or solar hot water panel, low impact finishes, next slide please, and sustainably forested wood flooring from Virginia. Now the goals were to, to minimize ecological impact while also factoring in cost efficiency and lifespan. The criteria used as the basis for the materials chosen for the structural system, exterior cladding, interior finishes, and window systems. They factored in embodied energy for material, environmental and human toxicity, and recyclability. And in figuring the financial factors, they had to look at both upfront and long-term costs. Um, based on their analysis, the total cost for both units of the condominium came in at $135 uh, per square foot, a little higher than they had projected or hypothesized at the, at, at the beginning, and then they understood why. With the subsidies that they got from the Piedmont Hous Housing Alliance um, that helps uh, the uh, owners with down payments and financing, the family income required to purchase out-in was reduced from a high of $74,000 annually to $46,000. The systems and design strategies of the out-in house reduce the operational expenses for the residents and therefore enhance the prosperity of its owners in the long run. Um, the present value of the total savings amounts to an estimated $6,600 initially to over $20,000 over a 30-year period to pay off the mortgage. On the sustainable design and performance side, the team installed an energy monitoring system that they developed and with data they got, um, they were they were able to produce recommendations and conclusions that informed future ECOMOD projects and their teams. They used over 40 sensors to measure indoor and outdoor temperature and humidity, current, voltage, water consumption, and wind speed. And all that data was fed into a program that calculated power consumption. And it was stored at a, in a box in, in, in the basement of, of the unit, that, and they connected to it remotely to access all that data. Um, they concluded that uh, with the help of their high-performance SIPs, they helped the house outperform a co comparable conventional home of the same size by 65 to 70 percent in terms of energy usage. So um, the understanding that they gained in ECOMOD 1 is helping them directly with other projects, including others in the same neighborhood. They have built numerous projects that, that um, build on one another, both in terms of knowledge and skills and design in building or knowledge and skills in design and building and evaluation, but also in terms of leveraging resources. The evidence that they had, they could take to other funders to support their project. So in conclusion, I want to um, make some references to a couple of, of ACSA efforts. Um, first, uh, the ECOMOD team won a, uh, an award, uh, ACSA and AIA to have a Housing Design Education Award that is heading in 2011-12 into its fifth year. With these awards, we recognize um, both curricula, general curricula, which is what the ECOMOD team won for, as well as for um, uh, specific projects. And uh, you can look, look at ACSA's website. We have a nice um, uh, archive of those projects, and you can view um, books like the one that's on the screen now. So I want to conclude by pointing up some, um, uh, talking a little bit about the affordable design project. Um, oh, back one, please. Um, 
the Sherry Aronson uh, work that I was citing before is, is situated in this affordable design, convening the conversation. You can download the, the full book. There's also a final report on there. ACSA has uh, a housing uh, program site that um, uh, includes work by faculty uh, as well as task forces that we've had to try to um, uh, essentially systematize the work that goes on across ACSA schools to build the, to build the knowledge base. But there are two, uh, two online resources I want to show briefly now. Uh, next slide, please, and I'll close up. One is um, the Affordable Housing Design Advisor, which I think a lot of people know about. And then the next one is KnowledgePlex. Now, KnowledgePlex was owned and operated by, the Fannie, by Fannie Mae or the Fannie Mae Foundation uh, before it was abandoned a couple years ago. And in preparing for this, or for this webinar, I started looking at some of these sites to see how much new information has gone in there. And, and it's, 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 it's KnowledgePlex, has, has, it seems to me, has been all but abandoned. The Affordable Housing Design Advisor um, doesn't have a lot of new, new stuff in there. And that's because it's very challenging to keep up the, the kind of research platform and, and evidence base for housing that, um, that needs to be there so that when people want to uh, uh, justify their sustainable design goals, if they're part of the Architecture 2030 commitment, or just interested in helping clients understand the impact of um, their uh, design and, and construction choices. And we need more of that. Um, there's uh, a third website that I didn't get into my slides. It's called Inform Design, which is uh, I-N-F-O-R-M-E-D-E-S-I-G-N, Informed Design, all one word, which is housed at the University of Minnesota. It was created by the American Society of Interior Designers to collect peer-reviewed research in a searchable database. And it's not just about interior design. It's about all aspects of environmental design. And I know that that, that database, which started out great, it's, it's very difficult to keep up. And so there are a lot of challenges in, in architecture education and uh, architecture practice and research to try to keep up this um, evidence base for housing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, that was a lot of great information and a lot to learn from. Um, our next speaker is Jamie Horwitz. Jamie's a professor um, at the Iowa State University. And she's one of um, the premier national re researchers really thinking about how we learn from architectural practice. Her current work is on innovations in products, practices, and parks. And she's the author of a fantastic, co-author of a fantastic book, Eating Architecture, that I highly recommend. One of um, the many interesting things that um, Jamie has done is that she was a fellow um, at Goody Clancy Architects, where she worked with um, their practice um, to find research useful to practice and to help them explore their work um, in, the, in their buildings. And so she brings this knowledge of how architects um, think about their work and really can learn from knowledge uh, to, to her work. She, her PhD is from the City University of New York. And she also studied education at Harvard University, where she obtained a master's, and her BFA is um, from Kansas City Art Institute. Um, but most importantly, she's one of the premier thinkers about architecture and how we learn from our work. Jamie, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you also, Michael. It's, you've got me really thinking about how my own work um, fits into the categories that you're using. And I, uh, I think it does. Um, it would be fun to kind of chat with you about some of it. Can I advance the slide now? Uh, is somebody else going to advance the slide? OK. Um, I'm going to be talking about the benefits of plan configurations in one building type. It's a very uh, systematic uh, kind of project, though it, it, it didn't start out that way. It evolved into it. Um, it, it has had both qualitative and quantitative um, analysis. And the quantitative did follow the qualitative, uh, most certainly. It, sometimes they can work together. And, and in this case, it really allowed me to have an extraordinary level of confidence about what I'm going to show you today. Um, let's see. The, the model of life care communities uh, 
that I'm referring to may be a bit out of date, actually. Uh, they initially had, these started in the 1970s, initially they had four components, or what I want to call four. Uh, they have fully independent apartments, you know, working kitchens, uh, places for your cars, gardens. They have a very deluxe uh, dining room, sometimes with bar, uh, library, living room areas, a uh, little store, a bank, sometimes exercise, or swimming pools. Um, it's a certain country club kind of atmosphere to some of them. They also have a skilled nursing wing. So there's no in-between. There's no assisted living as such. You could always hire people to come to your apartment, but you had uh, a fully licensed nursing wing, uh, or you were in your apartment. And I'm going to call the fourth component this idea of uh, guaranteed care for life, because that's what these places involved. Uh, people sold their own homes, put that money directly into a, a CCRC, uh, and that, with their monthly maintenance, was uh, care for the rest of their life. If they died, um, it worked like an insurance company. Uh, but many people lived for many, many years in them and continue to. And uh, the quality of the life care within it um, really has had a great deal to do with uh, ha they had to change their actuarial tables. In fact, people did better living in some of these communities. And um, it, it's had a strange kind of boomerang quality about it. Like, whoops. So I, like every uh, designer, I, I, I need a, a really good reason to get started on a project. Uh, I, I've learned that they, they sometimes grow like crazy once you dig in. And you've, you've got to cap, you have to capture my imagination, basically, to get me started. And, and it happened when um, I just arrived at Iowa State. I moved here from New York City. And my new colleague, Mark Engelbrecht, came up to me and he said, uh, well, I've never, I've never met an environmental psychologist before, but I wonder if you could answer a question that's been really troubling me. Sometimes I wake up at night and worry about it. He said, could you find out if residents are getting lost in a building that I designed? And he was right. It really did uh, motivate me. Uh, and I found out. <laughs> they were getting turned around, we called it. Um, but before I show you that, I want to... I want to say that uh, I, if I had understood what I was really getting involved with at that time, I might have picked up this, uh, this wonderful piece of diagrammatic thinking that was the result of many years of research on uh, senior housing from the 1970s. This is, these were studies. Uh, the, the grant went to Sandra Howell, Dr. Sandra Howell at MIT. Uh, Co-principals were Gail Epp and Polly Welch. You may all know these folks in another context or many other contexts, but at that time they were working with Sandra Howell uh, on a federal grant to understand what she learned from this first generation of low-income senior apartment complexes. And they communicated their findings with the, these three images. Uh, saying that the relationship between paths and activity spaces was most central to understanding the power that the architecture had in uh, the lives of the residents. And these were really only some of the few variables in these tower blocks that were designed. So the first uh, was what they called the branch. And that meant that in each of these cases, really, we should see that this is the entrance and this is the, uh, the elevator. And so uh, in each of these models, uh, there was one choice, and it had to do with where to put the lounge, the social space, the activity room, something like that. It was the one, uh, the question of what, where that location should be was one of the few changeable features. So she found that if you put the, the, uh, the activity room after the elevator in a cul-de-sac kind of location, she said that had the, the least friction, meant that there wasn't that much activity going on up to getting there. People would end up just going straight up in the elevator and really never get there. If you put the, the uh, social space directly on 
the, the uh, sort of the hallway from the entrance of the building to the elevator, then many people said things like, oh, it, it's like walking the gauntlet. You, you have to see everybody. There are these people who sit and watch you and ask you, what did you buy today? And it's, there's, there's the most friction and the least choice. But there was another model, and it had to do with creating a kind of uh, accessible segue from the path, uh, you know, close to the path, probably viewable from the path, but also a bit of a choice where you could see into uh, the social space, and that had the most choice. So we'll rethink that later. Um, the situation that, that caused uh, Mark Engelbrecht to wake up at night and uh, worry if people were getting lost in Friendship Village, Columbus, um, was that for, for like 10 years before that, he had uh, designed a prototype, CCRC, for life care services of Des Moines. They are in a really substantial developer of life care communities. They, uh, they develop them, they construct them, and they also manage them. So they're deeply involved in the business. And he had built one uh, that was uh, Friendship Village of West County in St. Louis that had an original uh, plan diagram of this shape. And then they replicated it four times this is one that I found uh, like on Google Maps, uh, essentially, last night. And they've changed it a lot, but you can see some of the fundamental features of it. And they've added some units. But my point right now is that Mark believed that the prototype had many constraints to it. And he was really hunting for an opportunity to uh, use the lessons that, that he had felt uh, from these four prototypes reiterations. So uh, Life Care Services uh, told him that he had an opportunity to work on a, a, uh, a site that was at least twice as large. And he started to figure out what he might do in this other exurban site, like how he would, he would break through what he thought was the overly compartmentalized uh, quality of the programmatic features. So. I'm, I'm shifting now. I'm, I'm trying to describe the constraint as I show you his solution to it. And I really love this line. He said he wanted to thread the commons through the building. So typically, here's the, the health care center. Here's the entry and common space with the dining rooms and all. Uh, that would be the end of it. It would have you know, all these other uh, wings of residences would have something like an open space that might have some plants in it or whatever. But he didn't want that. He wanted to have a quality that the commons was somehow going all the way through the building. And he found several different ways of doing that. Whoops. This is actually a map that they use in the, in the community. Uh, well, really briefly, he did something quite wonderful with the, with the wings. These five uh, pinwheel-like shaped wings are, have these very short, uh, you know, maybe five to eight units on them. And they all take these little 90-degree turns. Every time they take a turn, so they're short double-loaded corridors with a 90 degree turn. Every time it turns, it's open to the window and the courtyards beyond. There's a little place to sit. And then there's one of these big lounges uh, or activity rooms in each one of them. And, and they together wrap around a beautiful set of gardens and courtyards. In the process of doing that, he also stretched this place uh, way beyond all the rules of thumb that any continuing care retirement community he had ever done. Um, the, the distance between apartments and the dining room is up to 500 feet. Uh, it's a 174,000 square foot enclosure on this 20 acre site. So it, it's an, an enormous place and quite an elaborate place. Oops. 
after I talked to Mark um, in the university one day about doing this, I told him that I really needed to sit down with his staff, uh, Kate, which included Kate Schwenson at that time, and talk about the intentions that they had in this project. And that what I would do to evaluate uh, the building in relation to his question was to see if I could turn his intentions or their intentions into evaluative questions. So on that day, this is the, these are the questions that we made up. Questions were, do wings, wing lounges, these spaces, support neighborhood identity? And by neighborhood, uh, he meant these wings. Uh, second one was, is the building perceived as a system of linked commons? So he wanted to know, did the whole building seem to, to be held together by these hubs? He thought of this as a clustered plan, basically. And then he wanted to know, is the spatial complexity a benefit or a barrier? I absolutely don't have time to tell you um, all the focus groups and the kinds of questions and the kinds of summaries and analyses I went through, but I'll give you the answers. I would love to do that, I'll tell you another time if you want me to, but I, right now I'm going to say that I'm going to try to answer these questions and say that um, the wing lounges did not support neighborhood identity. The idea that this was a neighborhood made no sense to the residents. They thought of the whole place possibly as, as a neighborhood, but certainly not their wing. Um, one of the reasons for that is that these wing lounges, as we call them, are so booked that you have to, like, you know, you have to schedule one a year in advance, and you were likely not to be using one that was even near your apartment. You went and used another one, and that in, because they were in so much demand. Um, the other thing is that um, the idea of it being a neighborhood or being a commons or linked or anything, those terms didn't mean a lot to people. Uh, they did feel that they had a powerful sense of connection to one another. And it was evident by their 43 committees that they had, uh, in which they met you know, regularly in these, uh, in these lounges. And the fact that they, they took the, the uh, managers and the, the owners of life care services uh, to court, uh, actually all the way up to the Ohio Supreme Court, to earn the right to see the books. And they felt that they were very, um, they were able to be both assertive and also proactive and that they, they were, you know, they were very coherent and uh, connected. Is spatial complexity a benefit or a barrier? These people argued with me that it is a benefit and it's not because uh, they don't ever get turned around. Actually, everybody gets turned around. I was turned around in the building. Uh, but it's not a tremendous problem, and it does give them many benefits, and I'll try to show you a few. So this is one of the, the uh, living rooms that's off the entrance. It would be called the main lounge. You can see how the corridors go through it. The wing lounge uh, was even better than I think, uh, you know, I don't know that EGA understood everything that was great about these wing lounges. Maybe they planned it this way. Maybe. Maybe they, I don't know, the fact that you could see down the corridor, that you have, a, you have a glass door there and a closed door was quite important to everybody. Uh, just past the entrance is a full kitchen. There's a bathroom on the other side. Some of them have sort of an executive style uh, dining room uh, table with 12 chairs uh, or more in it. Um, the key features, I believe, uh, that ended up making them as important as they are is that they have a door to the parking lot. That means that members of the family or their church group or who knows can also park and enter directly into this room and have a very different experience of entering the community. I began to understand something I would call the ecology of common spaces. It's important that the main lounge is a place that doesn't require any commitment. You don't have to make a, a schedule a, a time or an event to, to use it. It's, it's a semi-public space. It's sort of charged up by the comings and goings of the mailmen and the people bringing in lunch. And the, the newcomers tend to hang out there, the people who don't have so many affiliations or who are less um, planful and less cognitively organized. Um, the, the pioneers who had been there a long time, the people who settled the place, who are 
old, but they are also um, healthier, would say that the people who are in the main lounges, uh, those are the people who loaf. And, you know, they're not like us, and that's fine for them. In the wing lounge, it's a destination place. It's semi-private. It's charged by the activity from the parking lot, probably, but it's really about people who want to play and to plan and are at a, a very different level in their lives. So both are important. Um, the circulation at, 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 uh, in this building is manageable to people uh, because you always see people getting turned around. Like they would tell me about how staff would be turned around and how funny that was. Um, I also had lots of evidence that people put their key in the wrong door or that they walked the wrong way, sometimes to their own peril because it would take too long to get back to their apartment and they would become very tired. But um, they said that having more choices and more walks was better. It made it less of an institution. Uh, getting turned around really wasn't a problem. And my favorite was that they also liked to be able to blame the architecture. So, you know, as they got turned around, they could say it wasn't their own fault. And it was, uh, I only started to learn these things when I stopped using the word getting lost. When I did that, I, people withdrew. They wouldn't talk to me. They thought I was trying to find out if they had Alzheimer's. And it was a really important shift to call it being turned around. Oops. So I was pretty excited about um, a week, after a week of living in this community and having all kinds of great material that I could organize and talk about. And I was very, very uh, enthusiastic at the time. And as I talked about it to people outside of architecture, they started to say, well, you know, did you control for this? And did you control for their health? And what does it mean that, I don't know, 65 to 70 percent of this community is typically female, as it is in all of the communities. You know, they, they wanted me to use place or the idea of the configuration of the building as only one variable to look at resident satisfaction. And the, the extraordinarily high degree of resident satisfaction that I found, I didn't think I, should, uh, I could attribute it to place, certainly if I was only uh, looking at one place. So I went to Life Care Services uh, to, you know, construct and manage and develop these buildings and um, got them to back me, to provide me with access to two other places. And um, the help of some of their staff while I would be there, they, they funded it. They did not pay me anything, but they also required that I uh, not publish it or make it known to anyone for at least seven years, which I guess is typical of a business. Um, what you should know about these comparison com communities is that uh, they are quite similar in all kinds of ways. Like they're all all-inclusive uh, models. They're based on the same kind of um, actuarial tables and, and upfront payment and no refundable money. Uh, they're, they're like an insurance plan. Um, they were all designed by Mark Engelbrecht's firm. They were all uh, run by Life Care Services. The issue that I, I chose to separate them and to compare, I will show you now. Uh, okay, so decided that uh, what Friendship Village Columbus, this community we've been looking at, that what it had was what I could call a distributed uh, commons, that it was throughout the building. And that the, the first one, the prototype uh, building, had a centralized commons. You can probably see that this is the nursing wing here and that this is the commons area, this is the entrance, and they actually had some of it going along this uh, shape also. The third one, which is hard to recognize in that um, footprint here, is um, what's called a split commons. And it means that, that there is the main commons on the first floor, and then on the top floor, there's some very elaborate spaces. So this is a centralized commons in St. Louis. This was one of the first uh, retirement communities that, that it was a prototype for life care services that Mark designed. 
The Split Commons is uh, Whitney Center in New Haven, Connecticut. It's on a, a narrow lot with a uh, very beautiful orchard of trees behind that, that were able to be preserved because of this shape. Um, the top floor has a series of very uh, beautiful spaces like this concert hall. There's a lot of uh, walking spaces and a kind of, you can see it up here, sort of a porch. Uh, the split commons, uh, you can see, is often empty at the top and filled at the base. So uh, a very, um, I worked out a, a whole survey uh, project with, uh, that were, was then uh, administered. Uh, I talked to everybody in all the places. We did sampling. Uh, we studied all three places in the same ways and had an enormous amount of data to analyze then by asking them a systematic set of questions about the issues we've talked about here, but also some of the questions that Life Care Services wanted answers to. Uh, a factor analysis was done about their answers. And this means that I got back a set of terms, like all of these terms, and I had to come up with a name of it. Um, it, it was enormously important to me to realize that these, these terms in a factor analysis mean that these factors are clustered together in the way that people think about their daily life. So in all three communities, I found that ease of orientation and lounges in residential wings were part of this thing that also included good company and physical activities. I named it good company, good times, because I felt that that's what it was in people's minds. The overall finding is that Columbus scored significantly better than the other two, so significantly and equally significantly from either one of them. So it has, it's as different at West County, County as Whitney Center. And they're, they're equally different from Columbus. The level of satisfaction was substantial. I decided to pull out a single element to try to look at, instead of looking at it in a cluster. Um, that was the distance to the dining room. In this case, similarly, there was, or no, actually, it's not so similar. Um, Columbus scored the best, but it is significantly different from West County. And Whitney Center scored very well, but it's also significantly different from West County. So this, this little uh, map here shows you that in this building, enormously spread out, very difficult to find your way around, the people were equally satisfied as they were in a building that has one elevator and you walk this way or you walk that way over six floors. Uh, it's pretty surprising. and that the the dead, long, double-loaded corridors with open wing uh, lounges uh, really did not add anything uh, to people's experience or to their orientation. So you can see that I can conclude. I, I, I didn't give you all the data, but there were there was like six committee meetings at this uh, place. They one of them was on writing your autobiography, but they kept meeting in people's apartments. It's a very different experience to uh, only meet in apartments and not choose to meet in, in these spaces. I'm, I'm saying that it has the least friction. It's, it's the most like the cul-de-sac plan. I think that, that the Central Commons uh, in West County had uh, too much uh, friction, the least amount of choice. There were no closed rooms for uh, even like uh, to meet with as, as the board of directors. You had to or the board of, of the community had to go to the manager's office to have a private meeting or to one of their apartments. And then there's Friendship Village Columbus, the distributed commons, the most choice. I think we have a great deal to learn from it still. And I, when I tell myself that, I often try to remember this guy um, who I would walk by every evening sitting in this little niche Things get quiet in the retirement community at about 8, but I would see him there later and later, like from about 8 to 11. And uh, very dapper, uh, he was reading his law journals, he was a retired lawyer, with two canes, so he basically had neither leg to work. And I asked him how it was that he came to read in, this, in, the, in the dining room in the evening when no one was around. 
He said that several years ago, while his wife was still alive, she didn't want him to smoke his pipe uh, in their apartment. And so he used to bring his law journals down here. And he's continued to do so, even though he lives alone now. And I think about him at the end, because I believe that we don't fully understand how people will make use of a extended, elaborated housing complex that invites them to use it in many different ways. So I want to uh, end this presentation by saying that I, I think that Friendship Village Columbus uh, is a place where people make themselves at home. And I think that uh, it's an enormous benefit uh, to a planned configuration. Uh, I mean, that's, a, that's an extraordinary thing to be able to say in this kind of built environment. Uh, and I want to end it here. Jamie, thank you very much. Um, what an interesting presentation and uh, makes me want to know so much more about uh, your research and how you undertook it uh, and, of course, about other kinds of research like this um, that are be do being done by other practitioners. I think that um, because of our uh, technical d delay, we're going to have to um, draw this up now in our presentation now. Um, I hope that we'll have more time for questions at future um, presentations. If um, participants have burning questions, please do send them into the chat and we'll try to answer some of them individually. Um, in really the meantime... I really enjoy answering questions I, and I, I'm sorry if it went too long. Well, it, not, it went perfectly. It's just that our, we were delayed at the beginning getting um, signed on. Um, so um, the um, instructions are up for those of you who want to get continuing education um, credit. It, um, it's necessary to um, complete the webinar um, survey report l listed here um, uh, by Tuesday, September 13th in order to get credit. Um, and for those of you who are um, working towards licensing, there's also credit available. Um, if there, again, if there are any questions, please do um, about credit or uh, scoring, do um, put them into the chat. And I hope everyone will join me in uh, thanking um, Michael and Jamie for excellent presentations. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. I hope to hear from people.